and welcome to the Pretty Housemate Corset Construction Tutorial. <laughs> this has been such a long time in the making. I have made literally hundreds of these corsets and over the years found what I liked best and what didn't serve, so hopefully it will be helpful for you as well. I sell this pattern in my Etsy store as well as customized versions of it, so if you would like you can purchase one of those and follow along, or you can use these methods for any other corset patterns that you might find. This corset does not include a waist tape. Um, you probably could put one in, but it doesn't really need it. This is a very light style of corset. It's a little more like a bra. It's meant to be a supportive, flexible, everyday corset. The methods that I'm using to construct this are ones that I have found through trial and error by studying museum corsets, as well as studying the work of my peers, the other corset makers in the community, so thank you so much to everyone who's out there creating beautiful things. I love that we can all share techniques, learn from each other. Here's my contribution to the conversation. Since this is going to be quite a lengthy video, I have included in the video description timestamps with a little table of contents so you can quickly skip to whatever part you may need at that time. If you have any questions about anything that you see in this video, I welcome those in the comments. Please do feel free to ask and I will do my best to answer. This is definitely a more advanced sewing project. I am going to do my best to explain it as clearly as possible but it is recommended that you have at least some sewing experience before you go ahead and tackle this project. Alright, let's jump right in. So really quickly here are the materials I'm using. Cotton Cotille on the upper left. We've got some blue taffeta, dark blue, and then the light blue sateen. A steel busk synthetic whalebone in 5mm width. And two silk buttonhole twist covers. Alright, so here we've got our two fabrics laid right sides together. I like to lay the outer stuff down first because that way it don't get left and right mixed up. So the line I've marked is on the wrong side of the cotille. So here I'm just marking the seam allowance from the edge and the quarter inch that the binding is going to take up. Then you just lay the loop side of the busk on. We're going to mark spaces for all of the loops. When we're sewing we want to avoid those so that there's going to be a gap in the seam for the loop side of the bust to go through. And on the other side we're just going to sew straight down the seam, no gaps at all. Alright. Yep. <laughs> Let's go for it. Alright, so here we've got the two pieces seamed. We're going to press them open first and then fold it to make this front edge and press it flat, like so. Alrighty, so we're going to baste these busks into place before we sew them with the machine. Once you've got it in between the seam there, we're going to use some of this basting thread. You can use normal thread too, but this particular thread um, snaps pretty easily when you pull on it, so I like it because it doesn't get stuck if the machine sews over it in the same way that like normal sewing thread does. Uh, I do a quick knot at the beginning because I just find it easier to pull out at the end. You could just find the knot and pull on it. Um, but we're just going to take huge running straight stitches trying to hold the fabric evenly um, on both sides of the busk. So you don't want like the top fabric or the strength layer, the cotille, either one to be scooted like too far forward. You can see my stitches are like five eighths of an inch long. <laughs> and then yeah, when we get to the end here, you can just take a back stitch and that will be plenty to anchor it. 
And this is just going to make sure that the bus can't wiggle around when we're sewing it through all layers with the machine. For the other side, simply lay them on. Make sure the top and bottom edges are nice and matchy. And then mark with, I'm using a Frixian pen here, but you could use a pencil or marker or whatever you got, just in the center of the loop so you know where to poke holes for the stud side of the busk. I'm sorry, my hand's really in the way, <laughs> but you can see now the little marks I made. We're going to use this little guy to poke through only the outside layer. For a while, I was doing the outside layer and the seam allowance, and I just didn't like it as much. It made a line on the busk that I didn't like, but feel free to experiment. Um, I like to poke the holes and put the loops in, or the studs in, one at a time. I'm trying to show you here that the studs are offset. They're closer to one edge of the busk than the other. So make sure you get, you want them to be closer to the center front edge. If you put it in the other way, then you'll have an overlap, which you do not want at center front. You want the corset edges just to meet. So yeah, that's one. And it's rinse and repeat for the rest. There we go, and now that all the studs are in, we're going to baste it together, same as for the loop. Alright, now we're going to sew through all layers right next to the busk on top of the basting with the machine. Um, I like to use a slightly thicker thread than normal, a very, very small short stitch length. And here we go, the busk is in! Alrighty, so here we have pieces two and three. I'm going to show you a seam that from here on out I'm going to call the sandwich seam, where we're going to sew the strength layers and the outside layers of these pieces all together in one go. So we're laying these, the top pieces are right sides together with the Cotill strength layer. Um, it's it's right side out is facing the table. And this is going to be the seam joining two and three at the middle. I did cut these with some extra width, which you can see with the paper pieces laid on them at the top. This is just so that they have extra width to get over the cording and still match up with the cotill pieces when they get to the seam. So when we sew it and take the pins out, it's going to look like that. I'm going to press piece three over towards the side seam. Alright, so now we've sewn this seam um, and I've also trimmed you can see I've cut the shortest one a little more than an eighth of an inch wide. I just find it helps reduce the bulk, especially if any of the fabrics are really dense. I'm pressing this with um, a lot of steam. I have a steam thumb button on my iron. I like to kind of stretch that waist area a little bit while it's still hot. It just seems to help it be super smooth. And then here we are on the right side. If you have a really delicate fabric for your outer, you might want to put a press cloth in between the iron and the corset. I love using this little seam roll because it kind of holds the seam up from the surface and just makes everything so much easier to press, giving some extra steam to the waist there. There we go. Alright, so now that that's all pressed, the first thing we're going to do is top stitch through all the layers about a millimeter or two away from the edge. Once that's all done, the second row we're going to stitch is going to form the boning channel. And you can see here I just marked the width of the boning plus about two millimeters. Um, if you want, you could definitely mark the whole length of the seam. Um, I've done this enough times that 
I just mark the start and then I kind of do it by eye looking at the side of the presser foot. And that's what it looks like on the back. All right, so now we're gonna mark the start of the cording channels. We're gonna mark the edge closest to the seam. We're gonna work from the seam out. Um, if you get this pattern from me, you will have all of these lines marked on the pattern. Um, in this case, I did not pre-mark my lines, so I am once again doing it by eye. This is me <laughs> peeling back the edge to see if I can kind of center the section. Yeah, these will be the edges. There will be two rows of cording, and then there will be a bone channel, and then two more rows of cording working out from that sandwich seam that we just have made. I'm using a heat erasable pen for this. Feel free to use your favorite marking tool. All right, now we're gonna go ahead and sew through all layers right on top of the line we just marked with the regular presser foot. You definitely could baste or pin this to keep your layers from shifting. Um, I like to just do it with my fingers, kind of smooth it out as we go. And same for the other side. And here's what it looks like on the back. Alright, so first thing to do is trim some pieces of, this is waxed cotton cording, it's one and a half millimeters in diameter. I need four for each of these pieces. So four for the light blue and four for the dark blue. I'll just go ahead and do the longest one and cut them all that length. So I'm using a zipper foot to show them in. I know my hand is going to get in the way a little bit, but I'll try my best to show you how I do this. So just wedge it in there. And you want the cotill fabric to stay flat, but the top fabric to be the one that's going to curve over this cording. Just use the zipper foot to get right up there next to it. rows we're gonna sew the bone channel in the middle and I'm using the same trick here that I did for the seam of just laying down the bone I'm gonna use some marking a little bit wider and then we continue on with the cording that's on the other side of the bone channel. I'm using my fingernails to kind of get the cord right up next to the last row of stitching. You could just as easily use a tool like a screwdriver or a maybe a slightly blunted awl or something. I can go ahead and do this to the other side as well. All right, so now we're just gonna trim the sides of the outer layer real quick. I like to do this with the rotary cutter because it's so precise and everything can stay flat. So yep, yeah, if you've got any extra, just makes things a little easier to trim the sides make them nice and even. After we get this trimmed, we can go ahead and put on the hip piece number four. 
All right, and now we're going to move on to piece four, the hip. We're going to sandwich seam this on the same way we did the seam between the upper pieces two and three. All right, so now we're going to trim down the seam allowance for piece two and three so that it won't make too much bulk on the corded hip piece. I like to trim this down to about a quarter of an inch. You can do whatever you like, and I just trim the bulkiest corded part and leave the other two their whole width. That helps kind of transition out. Then we're going to press everything down toward the hip. All right, next step is to top stitch the seam the same as you would for a bow channel. So we're gonna do that scant, you know, one to two millimeters away from the seam at the top, and then another line of stitching through all layers about three eighths of an inch away or six millimeters. Um, this can really be as wide or as narrow as you want, but I'm putting my second line of top stitching right at the bottom of where we trimmed the seam allowance down. For the fun part, all the cording for the hip piece, I like to go ahead and cut just a whole group of these at once. It's fine if they're a little too long as we're going to trim down the sides at the end. Um, I like to put this cord in the seam allowance because I feel like it's small enough and flexible enough and it kind of adds some strength to the seam, but you could also trim these short enough that they would avoid the seam allowance. And then we're just going to start stitching them in with the zipper foot all the way down to the hem. <laughs> Usually these take me about 15 or 20 minutes for one side, for one hip piece. All right, and here is the last piece of cording being put in. I'm going to flip it over in a minute, and you'll see that I've left the half inch for the seam allowance as well as the quarter inch that the binding is going to take up. Um, so next, we are going to trim off all the extra blue sateen and any cording that may be sticking out at the side seams. A bit hard to see here, um, but I'm lining up the seam line on my pattern piece with the finished seam at the top of the hip and I'm trimming everything else to fit. All right, so now we're going to seam piece five onto our completed two, three, four side front piece. This is going to be a sandwich seam. I have used a little patch onto the back side of that piece because the outside fabric was thin and I didn't want the bone to poke through right there. Um, that's very optional, of course. Just going to sew that seam, press it. We're trimming the bulkiest part of this seam, same as we did for the hip seam. You can trim down the other seam allowance layers as well if you like. These were thin enough fabrics that I didn't really feel like I needed to. I'm also going to clip the waist curve a little bit, like this, just to help it flex a little more. Alrighty, so now we're going to press the seam open. You could do the cotille layer first or the top layer. It doesn't really matter. I'm just going to gently press them with steam. I'm going to kind of stretch the waist curve. 
you don't want to really like torque the seam open because then it'll be stretching too much and you'll see the stitches and it's going to stretch a little when it's on the body anyway you just flip it over to the inside and same thing again the seam roll definitely helps hold it up off of the flat surface And we're going to go ahead and top stitch this, same as we did for the hip piece seam and the seam from pieces two and three. So however wide the boning is that you'll use, we want this seam channel to accommodate that. Next we're going to cord our pieces number six, the center back, and number one, the center front. So first we're going to sew that seam straight down the center back. Um, I like to use this really wide seam allowance because that way when it gets pressed and turned back um, it's an extra layer for the grommets to go through just a little bit to reinforce them. I really like pressing the edge this way. It allows the outside layer to kind of fold over really nicely and that way you won't see the inside white cotill piece, you'll get like just a tiny bit of extra blue on the fold. I'm going to press this nice and flat. And then my favorite tool when you need to press something really super duper extra flat um, is just a big block of wood. This is a $3 IKEA spice rack that I took apart, <laughs> but it works real great. It uh, absorbs all the extra steam and heat very fast and helps you get super sharp creases. All right, nothing too exciting here. We're just sewing the bone channels at the center back. I use a 3 8 inch wide channel for the first one and then a half inch away for the grommets. You may need a little wider if you have bigger grommets and then another 3 8 inch for the second channel. And we do it on both sides. Alrighty, so next we're going to mark the edge closest to the center back. Um, for the cording strips on this piece, number six. And same as when I showed you for piece two and three, we're going to work away from our current hard edge and like toward the seam that will attach to piece five. Um, if you get a pattern from me, these will be marked. But as you can see, I did not mark them here for myself. <laughs> I'm just kind of trying to center the cording detail between the current edge and seam. And they are completed. And we're going to do the same thing for the center front. All right, so here's the current situation. We're just gonna quickly trim the outside edges of our middle piece that may be overhanging. And then we're going to seam pieces five and six together. The first thing I'm going to do is pin the edge of piece five. I'm going to curve it a little bit as if it was going around the body just to make sure that the outside layer isn't too tight once it does get put on a body. You could do this uh, with thread basting if you really wanted. Um, this is just going to be how I start the seam. There are also different ways to do this. I've seen people actually, you know, make a crease and just pin along the crease. I've seen people put it on like a, a rolled, like a seam roll and pin it that way. You can do whatever works best. Once you've got that all set, we're going to seam all of piece five to only the cotill piece of six. 
to make sure that we are not catching the light blue sateen of P6 in the scene. And then we're just going to go ahead and pin that all together, sew it up, and press it towards the center back. And same thing for the front. Piece number one is going to be seamed onto the piece two, three, four edge, catching only the cotille on the center front piece. Alrighty, so now we've sewn those seams and we're just going to trim them a little bit as well as press them. So for these, I like to trim down both of the cotille layers. Trim one to about an eighth of an inch, maybe three millimeters. And the second one, just a little bit bigger. This is also called grading a seam. You're sort of making like a, a stepped layer so the, the edge bulk of that seam isn't so big. I'm also going to clip the waist a little here. This is quite a sharp curve on this particular corset. You may find that you don't need to be as aggressive with the curve clipping, but just kind of see what works. Whatever will let that seam allowance lay flat when it's pressed here is great. And of course, the less clipping, the better, the more structural integrity they'll have. So yeah, we just press the seam allowance towards the center back. I'm going to press it from the front here and also from the back just to make everything super nice and flat. Make sure we scheme out as much wrinkling as possible. This is the magic part. So we're going to clip the curve if necessary on the blue sateen seam allowance of piece 6, the center back. And then we're going to fold that seam allowance under and pin it. That's what's going to close up this seam. Um, now you won't be able to see it for a bit here, but I'm putting the folded edge of this like just past the seam. And this definitely takes a while, but that's totally fine. Just go slow, use as many pins as you need. I definitely find it very helpful to do this on some kind of curve. Um, I happen to get one of these really great, really curvy, like seam iron press things that I love for this job. But if you don't have one of those, even just the regular little seam roll that I've been using to press would still be helpful. Yep. Yeah. Like I said, just go slow, take your time. I like to kind of pull on it with my hands like you saw me just do there to make sure that there's enough slack in the top layer, the blue sateen outside layer, when it is under tension around a body. And yeah, that's the center back seam. And we're going to go ahead and do the same thing to the center front seam. Same process as I just showed you, except we'll be sewing um, the center front piece. Oh, the magic of editing. So yeah, our next step is gonna be to top stitch these down about a millimeter or two away from the folded edge that we have all pinned. So let's go do that. Here we are top stitching this edge. It's very slow going. Just take your time. I do so right up to the pins because I find that the presser foot likes to kind of scoot the top fabric along too far and cause like a torqued, ripply seam if I don't. And then after we've done that, we're gonna turn this into a bone channel as well. So I'm stitching 3 eighths of an inch away just the right width to hold 
All right, and here's what we have. Yay! Now we just gotta bind up the edges, put the buns in. Alrighty, so we are going to do the binding on the bottom edge first, because that way we can put all the bones in from the top edge. Um, here I'm just going to draw on the seam allowance. It's a half inch, so I'm using a braided ruler to mark it. I'm going to go along the whole edge, and once we've done the center front, we're going to put the other side on and mark that bottom point just to make sure they're like extra lined up. <laughs> there we go. And keep marking the other edge. Alright, so now we're going to sew the binding on. I cut straight green strips for this that are one and a quarter inches wide. Um, I cut them a little bit wider than I think most people use one inch because I want the inside folded edge to go past the seam. We're going to stitch this in the ditch from the outside to secure it. Get to the end, we're just going to trim it like so. And then guess what? More trimming! Let's trim off all the seam allowance. I love using a rotary cutter for this. I have to say it makes it so smooth. A really nice edge. Next, we're going to press all this binding down like so. And next, I'm going to show you the little bit of corner folding that I do for these pointy corners. You want this to be a nice straight line. And we're going to fold the bottom edge up so that it makes a mirror of the angle. You can really smash it with the iron here. Lots of steam for fabric, so it's going to allow it. And then we're going to fold this bottom edge up and fold the whole thing up again. See, and that folded edge is going to cover the seam. Um, I decided that I wanted to trim some of the bulk out of that corner. Sometimes I do this, sometimes not. It just kind of depends on the fabric. Use your own best judgment. And then once we've got that corner settled, we can continue on pressing the rest of the binding up. I'm sure you could also try and like baste this. I used to use pins and it was just such a pain to sew and my hands would get so scratched by all the sharp ends of the pins. If you have the little Clover Wonder Clips for quilting, you might like those too. But this is how I do it. Um, you'll see me using the seam roll kind of like a clapper, like that piece of wood I used earlier just to help hold it down while it kind of sets and cools. We're going to do the same little foldy origami at the back because it is also a point. And voila! Now we're going to top stitch in the seam. Now, look how fast this goes. I'm telling you, all that annoying pressing is worth it for just how nicely you can sew it at this point and not have to deal with a bunch of pokey pins. Even if you're skeptical, give it a try. It's the best. And at the end, I just backstitch a little, careful of the busk. Alrighty, so now I'm going to show you how I bend the busks. Um, we're only going to bend it below the waist, and you just, just take your hands and <laughs> kind of bend it. Uh, I've seen people use like the edge of a table for this as well. 
edges in your hands, you could do that. Just kind of go until you get a shape you like. This is really just to fight like the, the tendency of the bottom edge to dish out. And then after that, we are going to put in the bones. I'm using five millimeter wide, one millimeter thick synthetic whalebone for this particular corset. Um, I like to get it one inch shorter than the top edge. I go from the seam at the bottom and then I cut it one inch shorter than the unfinished top edge because that leaves a half inch for the seam allowance, a quarter inch for the binding, and then a quarter inch extra of space for the flossing. This one is really thin. I can just cut it with scissors and I like to round the ends a little bit with some scissors and a file. Once that's all taken care of, you can also heat shape these particular. So just a quick run with the iron and then you hold them where you want them to be shaped until they kind of cool. I really like giving the curve back out at the underbust. But um, yeah, that's very optional. Most corsets will do fine without shaping, but it can be really helpful if you have like a really squashy bust tissue that isn't going to hold out the corset, or if you want to shape the hip so that it can kind of pull the belly a little flatter and move most of the shape to the side. Those are the circumstances in which you'd want to shape it. All right, and after we go ahead and bind up the top edge, we're going to put some grommets in. You can mark these according to the pattern or every one inch, however you want to do it. I have a press, which I love, but you can also do it with just the little hammer anvil style setters or even the pliers. There's one side. Go ahead and do the other side as well. And then it's time to put some pretty stuff on. So I have here, it's called beading lace when there's holes in the middle for the ribbon to go through. I'm just measuring out the length that I'll need. And then I'm threading the ribbon through the middle with the bodkin. And this we are going to sew on by hand. So here I'm just going to show you how I pin it on. I'm going to start at the back. I like to start this just next to the grommets because when I have put the lace under where the grommets go in past years, usually the edge of the grommet will kind of cut the lace over time. And I think this is just a better long-term durability solution. Um, but yeah, what we're going to be doing is doing like a long running stitch through the very top edge into the binding. And then we're going to do a second row of long running stitch along the bottom edge of the lace all the way through the corset and usually I hide them when I can in bony channels um, but some poke all the way through to the other side too and that's fine. I try not to make them any longer than about half inch or so just to minimize any chance of snagging they might have. Um, it's important to stretch the corset as you apply this lace so that when it is under tension on a body it won't be too tight, it won't be pulling, possibly ripping. Um, for this particular corset I wanted to leave the ribbons a little bit longer at the front so they could be tied together in a bow, so I go ahead and take that out. We're just going to trim this and wrap this end of the lace around to the back side of the corset. Now you'll notice that it overlaps the loop on the busk a little bit, so we're just going to trim a tiny, tiny bit so that it will clear that loop and we'll hand stitch that in place.
So here's the thread that I will be doing the flossing with. It's a buttonhole twist in silk. This is the Guterman 30 weight silk buttonhole twist. And then we've also got the tire silk thread from Superior Threads. So the first flossing stitch I'm going to show you is the one I use on the upper part. Um, this one cannot go through the channel in the middle of the bone, so we're going to cheat a little bit with the V by taking a tiny, tiny nibble. This is a very twisty thread, so I like to work in shorter lengths, probably not more than 14 inches or so at a time, and you've got to kind of <laughs> untwist it as you go. Uh, we're going to start off with three repeats of that V stitch. Um, I forgot to mention too, I start this stitch about an inch away from the lace edge. Usually that's just total personal preference. Um, this particular flossing stitch is decorative essentially, um, but I do like to wrap it around the bone when it's going across the back right here. Just kind of help hold it in the channel. Each bottom of the V make a little bit wider as they sit right up next to each other and a little bit taller. I'm going to go ahead and knot this one off. When I do these, I do a quilter's knot and then I usually like to bury the tail for maybe a quarter inch or three eighths of an inch as well. Since I'm doing the rest of this flossing design in the contrast black, that's what color I'm going to pick up next. This one starts with a little snowflake at the bottom end of the V. straight across the X. Um, for this stitch, I'm trying to come up right in the middle of the V and I'm traveling only on the front side of the bone, just under the fabric, the surface fabric. I'm going to make a little flower top. I'm just poking down right in the center, coming up opposite. And the rest of this design will all be kind of variations on that theme, that same type of stitch. After this last one, we're going to go down a little bit to make kind of some little leaves. Again, the same little V stitch. And then we just poke through all the way to the back for the end. And knot it off as before. For the lower edge flossings, it's very, very similar. Um, we are going to change how we stitch the V a little bit, though, to more securely hold that bone in place. We start as before with a knot coming up at about an inch above the end of the bone. And then instead of doing that little bite in the surface fabric, we're going to go all the way through the corset to the back side travel up to the right side of the V. And this will give us a V design on the back as well as the front. 
and it'll hold the channel on the bone so that it can't slide around and over time cut through one way or the other. contrast layer of the flossing. Um, it's going to be the same design and we're going to execute it exactly the same way. I think I might stab through all the way on these. I can't remember. Um, but this part is purely decorative. The V is what's really holding the bone in place. So anything besides that doesn't have to be structural. It can just be pretty.
Thank you so much for watching and following along. Of course, as I said before, if you have any questions, feel free to comment and I will do my best to answer them. If you enjoyed this tutorial and got something out of it, there's a link in the video description where you can donate and help further my art. Um, there's also a link to my Etsy shop where you can buy the patterns for this. And I will also include links to where you can buy all the materials you might need for this project. Please let me know what else you would like to see. Um, if you liked this video and want more, if you want more construction videos or some other kind, yeah, let me know. This is fun. All right, I'll see you around.